right, so yeah, last Saturday was our one day VBS. Um, I think it went amazing. I think everybody that was there would probably agree. It was so much fun. Um, we had a blast with it. Uh, our theme was getting s'more of Jesus. So we tied in the whole camping thing. Um, and our scripture was Psalms 34, 8. Taste and see that the Lord is good and blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. Um, and so my heart for it was just that the kids, you know, they might not leave remembering the scripture um, or the stories we talked about, but that they felt safe and that they knew Jesus loved them. Like that was my heart, that they walked out of here and they knew Jesus loved them and he wanted more for them. That was our thing, getting some more of Jesus. He wants more for you than you even could under, like comprehend. Um, so that was, that was my heart and I really think we captured it. Everything we did. We had scavenger hunt, which was awesome. Uh, Leanne and Keddie like killed it with the scavenger hunt. It turned out so good. Um, I just gave them the idea and they ran with it. We did scavenger hunt, we had archery, um, the obstacle course. Gaga Pit, I know I'm gonna forget something. We had a lot going on. S'mores was really cool. Um, I know Grandma and Linda snuck a little, a little boy told us at the beginning, he's like, I've never even had a s'more. So Grandma told me a couple days later, she's like, just so you know, I gave that boy too. I'm like, I think it's okay. <laughs> she's like, he told me he wouldn't tell anybody. Um, so we just had, we had a ton of fun. Um, yeah, so I wasn't gonna share this, but Pastor Matt told me I should, and I didn't want to, because I don't look very good in the story, but I'll share it anyway. We're all human, right? Um, so God laid it on my heart to do VBS probably in like, February, maybe March, and I did not want to. I'm like, God, I'm busy. Like, I'm so busy. I was working a full-time job. Like, I'm like, nah, like, that's a really good suggestion, Lord, but no thanks. I'm good. Um, but he just kept, like, putting it on my heart, and he was like, like, just, you know, like, I kept having, like, thoughts about it, and then I think you guys even brought it up randomly, like, one meeting. It was like, what about a VBS? And I'm like, oh. <laughs> so then I was driving in my car, and God just started bringing back all these memories to me. Um, I didn't attend church as a child, but I was at VBS Faithfully Federated. Um, there was one in North Springfield or West Springfield that I went to. Every summer, kindergarten to fifth grade, I was there. My dad, I was telling my dad, my dad's like, oh yeah, free babysitting. Like, you were there, for sure. Um, so I went kindergarten to fifth grade all the time. Um, but that was about all of my church experience I had as a kid. But then when I was in like middle and high school, you know, my friends were starting to do stuff and and I would always have like these thoughts like, oh, that's not right. Or like, God loves me more than this. And God put it on my heart that day in the car and was like, where do you think you learned that from? Like who planted that seed? Like those kids, they deserve that just like you deserved it. So I'm like, all right, Lord, I hear you. It was really, it was like heavy, but it was also like, I should have just accepted it then. But I think it was really good that God really like brought all these things back to my memory. Like things I had completely forgotten about. I remember this time I was at the Albion Fair and somebody said something and I just spouted out, Jesus loves me. What? Like I didn't attend church. Like where did that come from? He was like, that was VBS. That was the Federated Church when you were in third grade. Like that's where that came from. So I got in my heart and I was like, well, if I'm doing this, like I'm going all in, like we're doing this. In this church, we do not do things half-heartedly. Like we don't do it. Like if we're doing something, we're going all the way with it, whether it's in the church or for the community, when we're praising God, like we, when we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it right. Um, so I was like, all right, well, we're doing this. And so I, like my heart was just to like have a blast with the kids and the volunteers, my other rangers, you guys did awesome. Like it was so cool to walk around and see like how excited everybody was. Like Jedry and Pack got put with a bunch of third grade girls. And I was like, as soon as I saw their group, I had them. I was like, oh, that might, no. They had such, so much fun. They had like a chant made up with them and like they were rocking around chanting the whole day. They had a blast. Melissa, like you couldn't even tell if she was one of the sixth graders or not because she was like in the Gaga pit with them the whole time. Like um, the s'mores, everything, you guys did so great with it. So I just wanted to thank everybody that helped the kitchen crew, like came in, they're like anything you need. They, they did extra stuff. I just wanted to thank everybody who helped make this day like so much fun. We had an absolute blast. It was exactly what we had envisioned and it came out perfect. Um, one more quick little thing. So I was, I was planning it, um, I was doing a skit and I had this skit that came with the curriculum, and I kind of briefly read through it, but I don't act. I don't really, like, it's not my thing. So I was like, oh, it's probably fine. So Pat was like, well, why don't you send it to me, and I'll take a look at it, and I'll do it for you. And I was like, okay. So I sent it to him, and he texted me back and was like, that's garbage. <laughs> He's like, that skit is garbage. I'm pretty sure it's what you said. <laughs> it was, it was, you had that tone. You had that tone. He was like, I can do better. And I was like, awesome, please, like, take it and run with it. And he did. And he ran with it, and it, his skit was so much better. And then he got Jezri in on it, and they were able to do it together. So I'm going to have them come up and do this skit. But just so you know, Pat wrote it, and his heart was in it completely. What could go wrong here, guys? Fire.
just for kids. I think during this time, it's a class work. Hey, you know, Pastor you know, Paul said he was away. We can yeah, I know, geez. <laughs> Pastor Matt said something before about how, if you guys, I don't know, those have been around for a while. Remember we had the god-awful mob carpet forever in here? <laughs> That was like so cool back in 93 when we put it in. We were with the times and then we kept it 20 years too long. <laughs> and there was an iron imprint up on the stage because <laughs> of an accident. So I'm we're hoping that the fire that we just lit does not become the next iron. <laughs> oh gosh, well, oh, that's right, right there, brother. All right, so just a little silly thing that Pat and I, we actually like camped out in here. It's like all the kids were like playing ahead of time and they all kind of came to the stair, or the chairs. And then when they, <laughs> Megan does her thing, they're talking for like, you know, like eight minutes or so has gone by. And it's like the kids kind of settled in. And all of a sudden Pat and I come out of this. I'm like, what? how long have they been in there? And <laughs> we kind of like played it off and it was fun. I did have a lot of fun. You're right. We had the little third grade crew and they were awesome. I like we had no issues, no one complained. They were all in it. It was great. And we even had a little, we were the, the Hallelujah Hikers, and the kids started their own little chants. So we'd say Hallelujah, and they all shout out Hikers. It's like to every crew, they wanted to show that we were pretty dominant, which we were. And Represent. it was pretty fun. I, I enjoyed it. So, all right, guys. So I'm going to talk to the kids we have and pretend you're all, pretend you're eight for a second. Get, get your inner child. Think of your inner camping and help me out because it's a little bit interactive. Because if you remember from going to camp as a kid, you have to interact, and you get excited, and we're all jazz and all that stuff. So, so we start. Good morning, <laughs> good morning campers. We said good morning. Thanks, guys. So, hey, we're going to talk about s'mores and getting s'more of Jesus. A lot of puns and kid stuff. And we're going to tell you how a s'more can actually remind you about Jesus. So, Pat, are you ready to make a s'more? Uh, s'more what? You know, like a s'more, like food to eat, camping, s'mores. How can I have s'more something if I haven't had any yet? All right, guys. <laughs> Who wants to help Pat out? Who can help me out with a s'more? Someone taller than five foot. Let's do that. Who, who, who can tell Pat what a s'more is? I'll call on somebody. Yeah, this guy's avoiding my eye contact. What's a s'more, Abe? Oh, get out of here, bread with marshmallows. <laughs> Have, uh, hit me up, man. Outstanding. Give it up for Andrew, guys. Yeah, yeah. It's all right, Abe. After this, you'll know. This is cool. It's cool. I see. That's, that sounds really good. Uh, so where do we start? All right. Well, here we go. We are going to start with a graham cracker, because what we need is a solid foundation for our s'more. Just like God wants to give us a solid foundation in his word, and that's why he commands us to read our Bible. Okay. There you go. That's good. What's next? So I'm thinking something sweet. What do you think we should use, guys? Maybe chocolate? Yes. We're going to go with chocolate first. And I see Pat's got a little extra chocolate on his. Yeah, and you know, something interesting about chocolate is uh, it's actually kind of bitter until you put sugar in it, and sugar kind of gives it that sweetness. And we can have all the right ingredients in life, and without Jesus, uh, you know, life just isn't as sweet. Right, because he makes all things new. Is that a little punish? <laughs> just like what we say all things new here in church? All right, does anyone uh, know what we add next? We got our graham cracker, we got our chocolate, what comes next? Marshmallows. That's right. It's one of my favorite parts. Um, oh, my God. But first, yeah, there we go. All right, so we're getting marshmallow. But first, we don't just put the marshmallow on hard, do we? No, that crazy people do that. We're going we're gonna to roast it first. I like mine nice and soft and gooey. So, Pat, why don't you give that a roast? That's, what fire is for? That's why we have a fire on stage. We're going to try this. Oh, boy. So Pat is actually roasting a marshmallow on stage. No one tell Pastor Paul. <laughs> Rotisserie style. So hey, just like how Pat is roasting the marshmallow, right? As we give our hearts to Jesus, this marshmallow is being transformed to what it was, to something a little more edible, a little more usable, right? And Jesus transforms our heart when we give it to him. 
Looks pretty close. Yeah, that's a thick one. Okay, that's done. Is it ready? So almost. We're going to do one more graham cracker, right? Right on top to kind of cover the whole thing and make it into a good sandwich. Just like Jesus covered us and covers our sins with his blood when he died for us. Wow, that's a s'more. That looks really good. It is pretty good. It tastes really good. But, you know, you'll never know how good it tastes until you actually try it. Just like you might not know exactly how good Jesus is and how good he can be for you until you trust him with your life. And try him for yourself. That's true. You know, it reminds me a little, about a little boy that trusted Jesus in the Bible. He brought his lunch to Jesus, and Jesus took that one little lunch and fed 5,000 people with it. That's not all. That little lunch that it fed 5,000 people, he actually had 12 baskets left over. He gave Jesus just a little bit, and he gave him back more than he thought he'd ever have. And so that's an example, kids, and non-children in here, that when we give Jesus our little bit, he gives us back so, so much, much more. more. Abe, you want a s'more? Yeah, praise God. What? Put the fire out? No, we got to let the fire burn, man. Let it burn, let it burn. Set this off to the side. I'm going to grab a pulpit. I can't wear that all service. I'm sorry. <laughs> Love the hat, right? Praise God. So, yes, uh, some of you may need to be reassured. This is not my first time doing this. I have preached on occasion. Um, went to the same Bible college that Pastor Matt has gone to and uh, had, had attended. And uh, like him, I actually had to repeat my first year student preaching. So uh, I promise I'll do better today than I did then. <laughs> Praise God. You know, we were talking, too, about how uh, preaching is a lot like uh, an airplane, how you have your takeoff and your landing. And, you know, some preachers are very good at their takeoff and landing. They're almost like a luxury liner jet. You know, they, there's just a smooth transition into the air and a very not-so-bumpy ride, some great service on the plane, and then a, a very smooth landing. And then you have some that are like a helicopter pilot. They'll take you on a guided tour of the word. They'll lift off and hover over a subject for a while and then move on to the next thing. I am not like that. I am warning you. I am more like a crop duster pilot in one of those old biplanes. My takeoffs are a little rough. We go bumpity bumpity all around up in the air, and there may be a few barrel rolls or to spin here or there. And then the landing, we may land safely, we may not. <laughs> but we're going to get somewhere today in the Word. Amen? Amen. It's going to be a fun ride. So praise God. Let's just open with a word of prayer real quick. Heavenly Father, I just thank you today, God, that sometimes you take the foolish things of the world that confound the wise and the simplest things and the, the simplest truths to illustrate your profound love for us, God. We just pray, God, that you would anoint this word, this message, that, Lord, those that are online, those that are here in our presence, God, would hear and receive your word today, God, and it would change our hearts and our lives. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. So, s'more of Jesus. S'more of Jesus. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed are those who trust in him. Have you tasted the Lord? It's funny how we bring this back to food, basic needs of humanity. There's a spiritual hunger as well as a physical hunger. And, you know, one of the first things that got Adam and Eve in trouble was some food. Amen? It was fruit in the garden. Just a simple piece of fruit got him in trouble. So today we're just going to use a simple s'more to illustrate some truth of God's Word. And we talked about laying that first graham cracker down, that foundation. And the Bible says that if the foundations be destroyed, what can the righteous do? And we are in a time where foundational truths are being assaulted on a daily basis. I'm not here to glorify those things or preach about those. I'm not going to give those airtime today. But you all know when you walk out those doors, the world is going to hit you full force. The enemy is going to hit you full force and assault the basic foundational truths that are self-evident. 
we've been attacked by a strong delusion, by lies, and we need to have our foundation in truth. Jesus said, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. We need to have a foundation in the word of God, in the truth of God's word. But more than that, you need to realize something. The Pharisees had a good foundation in the truth. They, Jesus said to them, you know, search the scriptures, for in them you, have, you think you have eternal life. But these are they which testify of me. He also told them, you do err, not knowing the scriptures, nor the power of God. So we get into error when we don't understand the word of God, the will of God, the way of God. We get into error when we don't understand the power of God. So I just want to touch a little bit on the foundation of God's power, God's word, all in the presence of Jesus. Because he is the word. The Bible says in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. Amen? Psalm 118.22 talks about how the stone which the builders rejected has become the chief cornerstone. He's our foundation. He's the cornerstone where we start construction. And I am not a master builder. You know, Paul talked about being a wise master builder. I am not a master builder. I am a, I'm good at destruction. A lot of people that know me can testify to that. My, my ability to construct is limited. I, that's not my greatest skill set. I'm working on it. But deconstruction comes natural to me. And I'll touch on that in a little bit. But Jesus wants to build on our lives. 1 Peter 2, 4 through 6 again mentions that he was rejected by men, but chosen by God and precious. And that we are his living stones being built up into a spiritual house. In verse 6 it says, I, uh, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect precious, and he who believes on him will by no means be put to shame. In Ephesians 2.20, it says, Having been built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. If you're going to build your life, your Christianity, your church experience, it has to be built on the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many, many, many churches that are deviating from that foundational truth. There are many ministers, well-known ministers of God that I grew up listening to that have started to stray from that foundation. We need to stay on the foundation, which is Jesus Christ. We base our biblical understanding off of who he is, his character, his will, his ways, his person. And when it talks about building on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, you know, the, apo uh, the prophets prophesied his coming, the apostles declared his presence and who he is. And if you recall, after the crucifixion and the resurrection, he was walking on the road to Emmaus, and there were two disciples that were talking and walking with him. They didn't even recognize him. And he began to speak to them of all the things concerning himself, concerning himself in the law and in the prophets. See, this, this Bible that we read, it's not just a self-help book. It's not just a book of, uh, of facts and history. It's a living testament of the living God whose fullness is in Jesus Christ and who has invited you to taste and see that he is good. Amen. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 3.11, no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. There's no other foundation for the church. There's no other way you're going to get to heaven. There's only one way. Amen. There, neither is there salvation in any other. If you took a whole survey, you know, in fact, in the book of Revelation, John is standing there and the seals are ready to be opened. And they said, who can open the seals? And John was puzzled and, and perplexed, and he, they, they cried out within the realm of heaven, you know, who can open the, these seals? And it was found no one in heaven or on the earth or under the earth was qualified, could fit the bill. But then it says, and John started weeping. All my hope is in those seals being opened. What hope do I have if those don't open? And it says, fear not. Behold, the lion 
of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. And he turned and he saw a lamb looking at it as if it had been slain. Amen. Jesus, the one who was slain before the foundations of the world, the Jesus, the foundation of our beliefs, the Jesus, the one who makes our lives new. Amen. Amen. He's the one we build on. You know, Jesus was walking with his disciples, and they entered a city known as Caesarea Philippi. I've been there, actually. Kind of cool. It was a cosmopolitan, cosmopolitan place. That's a big syllable word. Um, cosmopolitan place where Gentiles gathered and celebrated their gods right there on the shores of the Jewish nation. It was built by Philip the Tetrarch. It's kind of brown nose with Rome. You know, there was all kind of political machinations back then even. And in the midst of this Gentile city, Jesus turns to his disciples that are following him. In the midst of all these false gods, temples built to other faiths, he said, hey, who do men say that I am? What's the chatter going on? What's the local town gossip? What's the word filling in the marketplace? What's trending on social media about me? What are people saying? And they're like, well, you know, Jesus, they're saying you're this, you're this, you know, you're, maybe it's Elijah again or John the Baptist risen from the dead. And he pauses for a minute, he stops and he says, who do you say that I am? I'm sure there was some awkward silence. I'm sure they looked down at the ground, shuffled their feet a little bit. And then Peter, good old Peter, burst out with this declaration, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. And he said, you know, Peter, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you, but my Father in heaven. That is the revelation that I'm going to build my church on, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen. We need a revelation of Jesus to have a good foundation. We need some more of Jesus. It's not based on our experience, our education, or even our environment. It's based on a revelation. Come on, you can have some good experiences. You can have some bad experiences. But when you get a revelation of who Jesus is, amen, his word, his will, and his ways. But the thing is, when God starts building in your life, that foundation is great. We have a solid foundation in Jesus. There's always a progression. They didn't just leave Egypt and stop in the desert. They crossed the Red Sea. They crossed through the wilderness to the promised land. We don't just say yes to Jesus, believe on him, and then just stop growing there. Yes, it's a door, but it's also a way. It's an experience, but it's also a walk. We don't stop at the door. We keep going. In Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 10, the Lord's telling Jeremiah, hey, you know, I'm calling you to be a prophet to the nations. And he says, see, I have set this day, I have set you over these nations and over these kingdoms to root out, pull down, destroy, and throw down, to build, and to plant. Sometimes before God's got to build on our lives, He's got to tear some things down. Some of you can testify. <laughs> I mean, and it never stops. It never stops. There's a lot of days I wake up and I'm thinking I'm, I'm doing great in God. Then he sh pulls me aside and says, I need you to deal with this attitude. <laughs> thank, you, thank you, Jesus. They're wrong. I'm right. No, no, no. Let's look in the mirror of God's word here. Ouch. Squirmy, squirmy. He can squirm all day. You can't get out from under his thumb. <laughs> you can take it out on all the people around you. <laughs> well, that's not good. Or we can submit to his correction and change. And sometimes we need that change. Or we always need that change. But if we want some more Jesus, you know, we started with the foundation of graham cracker. What was next? That chocolate. That Those bitter things. God wants to make sweet in our lives. Those bitter experiences. 
when the children of Israel left Egypt, they crossed the Red Sea, a miraculous experience. And then the next chapter, they talk about how uh, they came to a place called Merah, which means bitter. Exodus chapter 15. They'd been walking for three days in the wilderness and found no water. Three days. I get thirsty after three hours. Let alone with a group of people in this room getting thirsty after several days. Let alone three million people getting thirsty after three days. When you're hot, when it's dry, when you're sweating, you've perspired all you can and there's no sweat left. Your legs are shaking, you're weak, and you start seeing things that aren't there because you're thirsty. And there's a lot of people that are thirsty in the spiritual realm. They're thirsting after something and they're seeing things that aren't there. They're looking for things and they're grabbing things just to satisfy a thirst. They're starting, they want to quench a thirst. Proverbs says, That a satisfied soul loathes the honeycomb, but to a hungry soul, every bitter thing is sweet. Can you come to God and receive some bitter, hard truths and let him make them sweet? Oh, here's one for you. Let's find out what happens to the children of Israel. They come to a place called Merah, and they start to drink the water because, hey, after three days, you need some hydration. And they take a sip and... Ugh, can't swallow it. It's bitter. God doesn't want people coming to our lives expecting to receive and walk away with a bitter taste in their mouth. You're a Christian and you act like that? You're a Christian and you say those things? Come on, out of the abundance of the heart the mouth speaks, are you speaking bitter or sweet? James said those things should not be if we speak forth bitter or sweet. So you get there and you, you see bitter waters. You know, what's funny about water is it reflects. It's a, it shows a reflection. God was testing their hearts. Sometimes he offends our minds to reveal our hearts. And showing them, you know, you've got to deal with some things here. You may have gotten out of Egypt, but there's still some Egypt in you. So we need some more Jesus. We need those bitter things made sweet. When I was a kid, I, I, our great-grandmother lived with us. And I remember sneaking into her bedroom on occasion to take things. I mean, it's what four-year-olds do, right? You know, you're curious, you grab something that doesn't belong to you and make off with it. And I don't know what I was thinking. I'm glad I'm saved now. <laughs> Sister Anne's looking at me horrified. Um, she had some chocolate in her uh, nightstand drawer one day. I pulled open the drawer, and I see this chocolate. <laughs> I was like, sweet. I remember pulling it out and taking a bite and immediately spitting it out because it wasn't what I thought it was. It was Baker's chocolate. If you've ever tasted Baker's chocolate, it's missing something. It wasn't, it, it wasn't sweet. That happens to a lot of us. We, we partake of things and we can have everything in our lives that seem to match up, that's perfect. We can have all the houses, the finances, all that. But... It's missing something without the presence of Jesus. A lot, all those things are passing away. They're, they're not going to be permanent. But when Jesus is added to the mix, man, so much sweeter. So much sweeter. I don't know if anybody here is familiar with Corey Ten Boom. If you don't know who she is, she was a um, Dutch woman. Her family were Christians. During the uh, Nazi Holocaust of World War II, they risked their lives to save Jews and hid them. There's a, several books that she's written, a movie, The Hiding Place. They eventually were taken and put into concentration camps. Her father died. Her brothers died. Her sister, Betsy, died in concentration camps. And Betsy used to say to Corey, you know, there is no pit so deep that he is not deeper still. We go through bitter experiences in our lives. 
But God wants to transform those bitter experiences and make something sweet out of them. When Samson was on his way somewhere, a lion came out and attacked him, and he killed the lion. Isn't it amazing that God can preserve us sometimes even when we're not where we're supposed to be? The mercy of God. But coming back through there, he notices the carcass of the lion, and he takes some honey out of that lion. There were some bees making some honey in that lion. Not a very appealing idea, but... Um, and he presents this riddle at his wedding, and he says, out of the eater came forth something sweet. And I don't know about you. And I sometimes don't know how God is going to do it because it's a riddle. But he can make something sweet out of something bitter if you just let him. And Corey Ten Boom, she went to a prison camp after she, after the war, after she was released. And there was a prison camp for some of the women guards at Raven, from Ravensbrook where she had been interred. And she came to speak to them about the love of God. Talk about turning bitter things sweet. When you go to your captors and you speak to them about the sweetness of the Lord Jesus Christ. All she could see when she went there, though, was the hardness of these women who had been hardened by war and suffering and the belief that they were a superior population to this inferior population that they had persecuted. She knew it wouldn't be easy to reach them, so she prayed that the Lord would fill her with his love and shine through her, but there was no visible response. Once she went, the women turned her away, wouldn't talk to her. Twice she went, they wouldn't receive anything she had to say. So she went to the superintendent and said, what is wrong? Why can't I reach these women? And he, the superintendent laughed and said, you know, they said that you're such a simple woman. And they are so much more sophisticated. They're highly cultivated and more profound in their theology. And they don't want to receive from you. So she was discouraged, and she went back to her room and prayed. And she's like, Lord, I'm going to try one more time, but I need help. And the Lord spoke one word to her. <laughs> it's, the, it's the simplest things. He said, Chocolate. And she went, she had a box of chocolate, and she took and started handing these women the chocolate. And they, it broke down walls because, man, you're after war, you don't have a lot of commodities. Plus, you're in prison. And the sweetness of that chocolate broke down those barriers, and these women began to receive as she told them the simple truth of God's love for them. Many of those women made decisions for Christ that day. In fact, she ran into one of those women a year later at a hospital, was ministering to a woman. She didn't even recognize her. And this woman said, do you know who I am? You were one, I was one of those women in that prison that you ministered to, and because of what you shared that day today, I know I'm going to be with Jesus. Just a simple illustration. Don't live with bitterness. We want some more of Jesus, not some more of what we've been through, but what he's brought us through. Some of you in this room, some of you watching online have been through some horrific things, and I will not dispute that. But again, it's a riddle. How can he make this work out? How can he fix this? How can he make something sweet out of this? Only by his power, only by his presence. He's such a good father. Amen. Amen. It's more of Jesus. He makes the bitter sweet. And how does he do it? He changes our heart. We show that marshmallow over the flame, and man, God is a consuming fire. He's the spirit, the seven flames in the churches. His word is a consuming fire. His presence is a fire. He wants to change. He wants to soften the hardness of our heart. The Bible says that out of the heart proceeds evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witnesses, blasphemies. 
covetousness, wickedness, lewdness, an evil eye, pride, foolishness. All these things come from the heart. We used to say the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart. And you wonder why some people can be highly educated in positions of prestige and power and can fall to some of the strangest things, the most wicked things, because the heart directs their steps. Where's your heart at, we used to say. And we need to say, Lord, search my heart, know my heart, change my heart. You know, when those two walked away from walking with Jesus on the road to Emmaus, they said, did not our heart burn within us? Amen. Church isn't about some meek and gentle man standing before a bunch of meek and gentle people telling them how they can go out and be meek and gentle. Out. Praise God for meekness, but meekness is straight under the control. You know, we are a fellowship of the burning heart. We have come to a living God He's alive and well, and he wants to change our hearts today. Jesus promised, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit within you. I will take the heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. That stony heart, that hard heart, as we saw the marshmallow soften and melt in the presence of the fire. Will you let the Lord change your heart in his presence? Yes, and some people do get a little gooey and sticky, but... Amen. The Bible says that love is as strong as death. The coals thereof are coals of fire. It's his love. Jesus sought love for his bride. And yeah, his eyes burning like fire. And this is real love, not this cliche love or this marketed love that the world is celebrating right now, trying to turn a fast buck. Throw a slogan out there, pander to a certain community. No, this is the love of God that challenges us and changes us tells us the truth about ourselves. See, I, I know people talk about the unconditional love of God. I may get in trouble for this, but I'm going to step into this troubled water here real quick. I don't believe it's unconditional because true love cares about the condition of its object. Oh, <laughs> I hope you catch that. His love wants to change your condition. I was lost, but now I'm found. I was blind, but now I see. His love wants to change your condition from sinner to saint, from darkness to light, from wretch to holy one of God. Amen. And it's a simple prayer you pray that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Saved from what? Said Jesus was our foundation. Jesus brings the bitter things, makes them sweet. Jesus changes our heart. If we want some more Jesus, we need to know Jesus is our covering. He changes our heart. He saves us from the wrath of God, from the judgment of God, from the penalty of sin. In Exodus chapter 12, 12 through 13, you know, talking about how Jesus is our covering. That final cracker went on top. The Lord's telling Moses, I'm going to visit Egypt with one more plague. I've already done nine. He says, I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night, and I will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. Judgment. See, we talk about going back to basics, building the foundation. We have Jesus as our foundation. Then we have to go through Hebrews chapter 6. That's another sermon altogether, but talking about repentance from dead works, dead works, faith toward God, baptisms, laying on of hands, resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. I remember we were out street preaching one time, a woman walked by and she said, you know, the Bible says God, God, God said don't judge. The Bible says not to judge anyone. And I looked at her and said, why does the Bible have a book called Judges? Her mind went, Pow. yes, there is a judgment coming, praise the Lord, but this is a promise. The blood shall be a sign for you in the houses where you are, 
And when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Amen. The blood covers and saves, protects. Oh, the blood of Jesus that washes white as snow. John was baptizing by the Jordan, and when Jesus came, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. God made this law that without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sin. So in the Old Testament, they had a sacrifice, oxen, lambs. They had to slay them and apply the blood until Jesus came. The types and shadows are done away with. Now we have the perfection of God's will in the man Jesus Christ who gave his life for us. Satisfied the wrath of God. Became a propitiation for our sins. That's what that means. It means he satisfied God's wrath. And now you can enter into fullness of life, newness of life with Jesus because he rose from the dead. In November of 2008, there were some terrorist attacks in Mumbai, India. These terrorists attacked many notable landmarks, including some luxury hotels, including the Taj Mahal Palace. Right next to this hotel is a small cafe. There's a man named Joey Jitan dining there with some friends. And suddenly they heard gunfire. Someone snatched Joey out of his seat and shoved him under a table and said, get down, get down, get down. Next thing you know, chaos. As armed gunmen stormed through the cafe, several minutes passed by. You could hear the sporadic fire of gunfire, the crunch of glass as these booted men walked through looking for any survivors. Joey lay there in fear for his life not knowing who was laying across him. Several times these men passed by him, but they didn't, they didn't accost him. They didn't touch him. When it was all over, many people had died, but Joey was still alive. He returned home, and he was asked many times, why were you spared? How is it you're still alive? The only answer he could give was, I was covered in somebody else's blood. I was covered in somebody else's blood. That's how I survived. Will you let the Lord Jesus Christ cover you with his blood? Oh, the sweetness of God. To turn the bitter things sweet. All the circumstances of your life turned around and transformed by his presence and his power. This world wants to talk about uh, all this transgender transformation. Jesus is the one that transforms. Don't you dare pervert what God wants to do. You want a real change. Let him cut your heart. The devil always wants to pervert and wants to cut in private places. Jesus wants to go to a very private place and make it his secret place. Amen. So what are, what are we saying today? We're saying taste and see. The Lord is good. We use a simple illustration of a s'more. But it's so much more profound than that. The Lord wants you to take it. And you know, we can, we can make that for you and offer it to you. But until you take it in your hand and partake of it, it doesn't become a part of you. You can come to church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. You can watch online. And read every book, but until you get down on your knees and acknowledge the Lord Jesus Christ for yourself, until you invite him into your, your home, into your heart, you'll never know how good he can be. I can tell you about it, but until you taste. Again, we have natural hunger, but there's a spiritual hunger that only the Lord can satisfy. 
Let me go back to Corey Ten Boom. When she offered that chocolate to those women, she began to quietly instruct them that, uh, <laughs> hey, no one said anything to me about this chocolate. Remember, they thought they were more sophisticated. They're like, well, yeah, we did. We, we thanked you for the chocolate. <laughs> she said, no, no one questioned me about it. No one asked about where it had been manufactured or its ingredients. You've just done exactly what I asked you. You've taken and enjoyed it. And I know there's many people that have sat on your laurels for years debating on whether or not you just want to partake of this fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. You've analyzed and critiqued everything. You've thought about it. Just take the step and find out how good he can be. Many watching online, many in this church right now, just taste and see. Blessed is the man that trusts in him. Trust him for your life. Trust him for your salvation. God has so much more for us than we realize. Don't base his don't don't base your perception of who God is based on your experience. Remember it's a revelation. Whether you've had a good upbringing or a bad upbringing, don't base his character on man's actions. He wants to transform and change us in his presence. He wants to make all things new. Amen? Amen. Amen. So right now I'm going to ask Pastor Matt to come up. Amen. Let's give the Lord a hand. Amen. Very good, very good job, Brother Pat. Thank you so much for sharing today. And you know, let's just bow in prayer. Lord Jesus, Lord, we thank you, God, for, Lord, even the testimony as we started with uh, Ranger Meg and as she shared her heart, God, and for all those seeds that were planted in her life in VBS, God. And Lord, we pray for every seed, every young person that came through this VBS, God. We ask you to plant your word deep in their heart, oh God. So when their situations and circumstances arise in their life, even at a young age, God, your word comes out of them, God, Lord, that they would know that they are loved, Lord, by you, God. We thank you for those seeds, God. Make them grow deep, God. Bring forth much fruit, God. We thank you for the opportunity to minister, Lord Jesus, to those lives, God. I thank you for the word that came forth today, God. Lord, I ask you to just let it go forth online and in this room, God, that we would know that we are loved, God. Lord, and you have a plan for our life, God. Lord, that, that foundation, the God, that our faith is built upon is the revelation of who you are, God. Lord, the truth of your word, God, that the situations of our life, God, Lord, that you turn bitter things to sweet, God, like only you can do, God. Lord, you cover us. Man, you cover us. Your banner over us is love, God. And you showed that on the cross, God. And you showed your power over death, hell, and the grave, God, are rising again, Lord. I thank you so much for all you're doing, God. Lord, we pray, God, for this week coming up, Lord Jesus, Lord, that you would move, God, Wednesday night as we go out into our community, God, and bring invitations and something sweet, God, as ice cream, God. Lord, I thank you for that. Lord, and ask God for those seeds, those invitations to go out, even online and social media, God. Lord, and, and even as we share with others and invite people, Lord, to this community outreach this Saturday, God, that your hand would be upon it, God. We would see many souls come into your kingdom through it, Lord Jesus. Have your way, God. We give you our lives afresh and anew. Fresh and anew, God. We thank you, Jesus. I ask you to go forth in, in every person, God. Lord, that you would have your hand upon us, Lord. Let your light shine in the darkness, God. In Jesus' mighty name, come on, the church said, amen. Isn't that a good word today? Hallelujah. Some more of Jesus. That's so we need. Well, you've been to service. Now go be the church. We hope to see you in the family room next door. And see you Wednesday night. Remember to sign up for all the stuff, especially the baseball game. Sign up in the foyer. God bless you. We love you. As always, just so you know, if you ever.